Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 K-State Garden Hour webinar series. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. If you are a regular, welcome back, and we're happy to see you return. This webinar series began in the spring of 2020 as a hope to share extension gardening education during the height of the pandemic. We've had great success since then and have reached over 36,000 gardening enthusiasts just like you. This webinar is hosted by K-State Research and Extension. My name is Calla Edwards and I'm the Horticulture Extension Agent for Butler County. Everyone involved in the development of this series is an extension professional for K-State. Most of us have a background in horticultural education or related discipline, but most of all, we each have a love for educating and sharing important gardening topics. Before we get started, we have a couple quick housekeeping notes to cover. Uh, please use the Q&A feature for questions related to the presentation. Uh, that is where we will get our questions to answer at the end, and agents will go through and answer questions throughout the presentation. Uh, if you have questions related to Zoom or Garden Hour in general, uh, please use those in the chat feature. Our moderators today are Sharon Ashworth and Lynn Lowry. They will be sharing information throughout the chat during the presentation, and they will also help us facilitate the Q&A portion of the webinar. Today's webinar is recorded and should be posted tomorrow afternoon to the Garden Hour website. We also will upload any resources that are shared through the chat to the website for you to look at at a later date. Um, our website is also where you will have access to previous topics and upcoming topics for our 2022 series. Today's topic is wildlife control and prevention in the lawn and garden. And I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Drew Ricketts. He is an extension specialist um, with wildlife, and I know he is going to do a wonderful job. So give us just a couple minutes and we transition to our presenter slides. All right. I think everybody could hear me. I couldn't hear the last thing that Calla said. So, uh, Cheryl, if you can't hear me, send me a text message and I'll get everything turned on. Um, it's fine. Okay, thank you. Um, as as Calla mentioned, I'm going to be talking about wildlife damage management, basically. So that includes both prevention and control of wildlife damage. And the focus will mainly be on the lawn and garden today. The, the content that I'll be sharing today will, will include some background information that is going to be just some text on some slides, and I apologize for that, but I don't know any better way to include some of this stuff, but the, the bulk of my presentation today will actually be looking at some examples of different kinds of wildlife damage and thinking about how to identify those. So, it's important to understand that human wildlife conflicts have occurred for thousands of years. Basically, as long as there have been people wildlife has been causing problems for us. If we look back to uh, some biblical stories, you know, one of Aesop's fables is about a crane that was depredating grain and a farmer caught that crane with a net and took care of the problem. Uh, Egyptians tamed cats in part to deal with damage that was being caused by rodents. So this is something that, that we've been dealing with for a very long time. Oftentimes, the most obvious response is to remove the offending animal. Um, the reality is death works. If an individual animal is causing a problem and we remove that animal, it can no longer cause that problem. But one of the problems with that is um, if we don't take care of the root cause or the ultimate cause, then that wildlife damage can continue to occur. And we want to be causing or excuse me, um, removing problems for the long run, not the short term. Also, victims typically don't consider their contribution to the problem. Uh, we oftentimes attract wildlife to our yards, to our gardens, to the lawn, and then once they're there, they start causing problems that we don't want them to cause. So that's how we contribute to things. And as I mentioned before, I kind of got out of got out of order on these bullet points, but damage most of the time will reoccur unless we address the root cause or the ultimate cause. And, that, and that's in relation to um, removing wildlife. So we always want to try and identify uh, 
why wildlife damage is occurring so that we're not just treating symptoms. And if we think about the adaptability of wildlife related to wildlife damage, not all critters that cause problems are overabundant. Sometimes we have rare species that cause problems. That's not typically true though. Um, the vast majority of species that cause problems are very abundant. And some of these species like white-tailed deer and raccoons are highly adaptable to the, the environments that create that we create in areas that we want to live. And when they become very abundant in these places, then they can cause lots of problems. And so we have to be able to think about that and address it relative to trying to stop wildlife damage. Anytime that we're dealing with problems that wildlife cause for people, we need to think about four main principles. And these are the principles that, that underlie wildlife damage management um, in the whole field of wildlife management. So the first thing we have to do is be able to recognize and identify damage patterns and the culprit species that's responsible for causing that damage. We also need to be able to understand wildlife biology and how it relates to the management of damage. So many problems that critters cause for people come back to or are related to the natural history of that species. Uh, this is not related to lawn and garden wildlife damage, but I help a lot of people who are having trouble with coyotes killing sheep and, and, and lambs. And I know that those problems are, are gonna be most common during the summertime when coyotes are raising pups. And that's the time of the year when uh, those larger food sources are most important to coyotes. We also have to know our management options. So different species, uh, need different solutions. And some of that is also related to local, state, and federal laws. Depending on where you are in Kansas, your options may be very, very different for dealing with a wildlife damage issue. For example, um, in the greater Kansas City area, within some municipalities, we cannot trap wildlife that are causing damage, even if we're going to move them around, um, and even if we're using cage traps. In other parts of the greater Kansas City area, uh, individuals can trap and remove wildlife that are causing damage on their property, just like they could in most rural areas. And so we have to know those laws that affect what we can do. One, sorry, the poll just popped up on my screen. One great place that you can look at for resources related to what's legal, what options work well for different species, how to identify wildlife damage and those sorts of things is this website, wildlife.k-state.edu. And this is a K-State website that, that I help curate now, um, but you can see that it's listed out by wildlife species. So if you're having problems with beaver or cottontail rabbits or moles, for instance, you can click on those links and go to the resources that we put together for those different species. There's also information here about how to become a nuisance wildlife control operator um, and, and various other information about legal issues and, and other issues about wildlife damage. So I encourage you to check out this website if you're experiencing damage and need help with that. So I teach a semester long course every other spring about managing human wildlife conflicts or managing wildlife damage. And in that course, I teach about a whole bunch of different methods, probably half a semester worth of different methods that work for some critters in certain situations when we have wildlife problems. But the reality is most of those aren't practical for most situations that most citizens deal with. So when we're thinking about practical wildlife habitat, or excuse me, wildlife damage management, we need to think about this acronym, H-E-R. And in that acronym, H stands for habitat modification. So we're removing the resources that the critter is coming to our property to damage or that are attracting to the critter to our property. So if we think about the components of habitat for a critter, it's food, cover, water and space. In a yard, we only have so much space, that's not something we can affect, but we can remove the food that's attracting a critter to the, to the property, 
the cover that's attracting them in the water. And this is sort of an extreme example here, but you know, this bare crop field doesn't offer most critters any reason to be there. It doesn't offer them food cover or water. So that's not a place most critters are gonna wanna be for very long. We can exclude animals. Exclusion can be through fences or tree guards, which we'll talk about both of those things in a little bit, or it can be through things like repellents. So we're just keeping the critter from accessing the resource that they're damaging that we don't want them to damage. And then the R stands for removal, and that removal can be dead or alive. In this example, we had beaver that were uh, building a dam in a creek and flooding a large area. They were also cutting trees down that the landowner valued. And so those beaver had to be removed and there's not really a good option to remove beaver in, in an alive way or remove living beaver. And so those beaver um, had to be removed through lethal control. Lots and lots of times when I talk to folks, um, you know, they, they, they don't want to hurt the animals that are involved in wildlife damage. They, they want to trap them and move them, which as a wildlife biologist, I would call that wildlife translocation. Um, there are some problems with this though. Most of those critters don't live happily ever after, or they may come back. So the, the first problem is the vast majority will either return to the site of capture or try to. New individuals also replace the ones that are moved. And so when we're thinking about long-term impacts to wildlife damage, if we're looking for a solution, then Translocation is not a solution. It's just a treatment for a symptom. Translocated animals often cause problems elsewhere. They become used to taking advantage of the resources that um, they're damaging at our place. And so when they move them elsewhere, then they seek out those resources because they know they're good. And so they cause problems for other people. And this is the, the thing that surprises a lot of people. You know, the reality is they don't live happily ever after. Many of the critters that we move die a long, slow death. So one example is a 2004 study where gray squirrels were trapped from a college campus um, and relocated to an area with a large forest with basically perfect habitat for gray squirrels. And just a few weeks later, only 3% of those squirrels were still in the area. So 97% of them either died or moved. In other examples where we've relocated raccoons from urban areas uh, that were causing damage, trapped them, put radio collars on them, turned them loose. About the best survival we see in those studies is 50%. And when they locate those 50% of individuals that did survive, uh, most of them are emaciated. They're probably going to die in the long run. And they've exhibited very, very large homing movements trying to get back home. What about other consequences? Well, the reality is anytime we move an animal, we're moving anything that's on the outside of them or that's on the inside of them. So we're moving around any parasites or diseases that that, that animal contains. Is it cost effective? Well, you know, if we're talking about a raccoon that is getting into fights with our cat or our dog on our back porch, and this is a rare instance, then moving that one raccoon um, probably isn't an expensive thing that's going to break the bank. But now let's think about all the raccoons that cause problems in the greater Kansas City area, or all the skunks that might be digging up yards in Manhattan. When we start putting it into context, where we're not just thinking about individual animals, but we're thinking about the species in general, then it's typically not cost effective. What about government policy? Well, if I've got a critter causing a problem on my land, I can trap it and move it to public, public area just fine, right? Well, the reality is no. You must have landowner permission to trap, move, and release wildlife on that property. Even if it's public land, you have to have permission from the manager of that property. So that is uh, one thing that's a big misconception for folks. So our alternative to uh, wildlife translocation is lethal control. Is it safe? 
uh, that's one of the big questions that a lot of folks have. And the reality is that lethal control can be the safest way to deal with nuisance animals when habitat modification or exclusion for efforts fail or aren't practical. You know, if we start thinking about trapping critters and moving them around, we're exposing ourselves to being bitten, clawed, gored, or so uh, otherwise injured by that species or that individual. What about ecological consequences? You know, our, our society typically thinks about wildlife and animals from an individual standpoint. That's how we think about ourselves, um, our pets and that sort of thing. But when we're thinking about wildlife management, we think about populations rather than individuals. And the reality is that removing a few problem animals generally doesn't affect ecological integrity or the integrity of a population. Is it practical? Well, the reality is that lethal control buys us time to implement other methods. If we have an individual that's causing a problem, we ha often have to remove that individual so that we can put up exclusion methods or modify habitat so that other critters can't cause problems. But we have to get rid of the one that's causing the problem first. Is it humane? Well, if we're following American Veterinary Medical Euthanasia, excuse me, Association Euthanasia Guidelines, then that death is going to be as good of a death as it can be. And that's what euthanasia means, is good death. So if we're following those guidelines, then yes, euthanasia is humane. What about legality? Can we just trap critters and kill them? We sure can't do it willy-nilly. Uh, but we do have a statute that basically says that a landowner or legal occupant may use lethal control to stop damage from an individual that's damaging their property or when found in or near buildings. So unless a critter is uh, threatened, endangered, or otherwise protected, maybe it's a migratory species and so it's federally protected, then we as landowners or legal occupants can use lethal control as a method. All right, so that's the end of, of all the text and talking about the background. And I know I talked about lethal control a lot, but it's something that's very misunderstood when I talk to folks. And so I feel like um, helping people understand that translocation isn't always the best method and, and definitely isn't humane in a lot of instances is very important. So the Eastern mole, this is a really cool species uh, from a biology perspective. They're highly adapted to life below ground. They have very large front feet with large claws that uh, allow it to dig very quickly through the soil. They have very small eyes, very reduced earlobes. In fact, they don't have external earlobes. Um, and they're just really put together to swim through the soil. Now, the downside of this species is that they like to um, eat grubs, earthworms, and other critters that live below the soil. And oftentimes those critters are in our yards. And so they damage our property and especially nice turf by creating these runs or subsurface tunnels that they sort of push up as they're moving through the yard looking for grubs. Uh, when they're down deeper in the soil profile, then they will clean out their tunnels and make these mounds that we oftentimes call molehills. So I mentioned that this critter is an insectivore. They do not eat plant matter. That means that poison peanuts are probably not going to be a good option. There are other options for toxicants for moles available as well. And my predecessor, Charlie Lee, did a study on this. And the bottom line is that the toxicants typically did not work on a consistent basis. And the best control that Charlie saw was a 20, or excuse me, a 14% decrease in activity after 21 days. So that is not very efficacious control. And I've heard it said by quite a few different people that you can fool some of the moles all the time and all the moles some of the time, but you're never gonna fool all the moles all the time. So for effective control on moles, you need to either learn how to trap them 
or learn to live with them because we can't exclude moles, right? We can't build a fence that's below ground that's gonna keep them out of our yard. So if we're gonna trap moles, the first thing we have to do is find a trap. There are lots and lots of very good traps on the market. These harpoon style traps um, have been a very common type of trap that have been around for a very long time. All the traps in this picture are effective traps, but they're set in different ways. So that's an important thing to remember. The next thing we have to do once we have our trap is to select a trap site. Uh, and to do that, we're gonna go out into yard and we're gonna look for mole sign. When we look at these subsurface tunnels, we're gonna see some areas where we have longer, straighter sections of run, and then we're gonna see sections with lots of branching. Those areas with lots of branching are feeding areas where the, where the moles have been below ground looking for uh, earthworms and grubs and those sorts of things. These longer, straighter sections are areas that they're using to move back and forth within their territory. We don't know if they're gonna come back to a feeding area again, but they typically will use these longer, straighter sections to run. So those are the areas we wanna focus on. Once we find these longer, straighter sections to run, then we need to poke a test hole. You can do that in the run with your finger. You can use a probe like a dowel rod or a metal rod. And the important thing is that we've created a cavity that goes down into the tunnel and we can see that vacant space in the soil that's the tunnel. If we come back and it looks like this, it's been plugged. And that means a mole has come back through the tunnel since we made that hole. If it's plugged, then that's a good spot to set a trap. If it hasn't been plugged after a day or two, then that's probably not a very good spot to set a trap. So to set mold traps here, I've got some excerpts or some images that have come from um, some mold trapping videos that, that Charlie Lee and I worked on together. So here, Charlie has identified a long straight section of mold run that comes through here. He's created a test hole, it was plugged, and now he's placing his trap. So he's got his out of sight mold trap set right here. He's using a masonry trowel to basically cut a channel for the jaws to open and close in on each side of the trap. Now he's going to use his thumb to create an obstruction in the roof of that tunnel where this trigger for the trap is gonna set. Once that's done, he's gonna hold the back side of the trap, gonna hold on to the trigger, depress that trap down to where the trigger is on top of the obstruction that, that he created. And here's what the completed set looks like. So that's how you set this type of trap. And this is going to work really well when the moles are up in the, in the uh, shallow surface portion of our subsoil. If there's more than about an inch difference between the top of that run and where the, the top of the tunnel is, meaning we have more than an inch of soil, then we need to actually dig down into that burrow system place the trap deeper, and then fill back in around it. If you have questions about um, how to set mold traps, there's some great videos on YouTube. Uh, I have one up right now on the KSRE Wildlife Management YouTube page. There's lots of other ones available as well. All right, our next critter, pocket gopher. So this is the other main critter that, that will build soil mounds in yards in Kansas and cause problems. So we can see that with these very large yellow incisors, this species is a rodent, whereas the, the mole that we just talked about is an insectivore. These critters, the pocket gophers, are even more highly adapted for life below ground in that they've got somewhat reduced eyes, somewhat reduced uh, openings to their inner ear, but they have cheek pouches. That's why they're called pocket gophers, is these external cheek pouches that they have. And these are basically designed so that when they're below the surface of the soil in their tunnels, they can look up, use their claws to dig and expose roots, bite them off with their incisors that are always on the outside of their lips because their lips close behind their incisors, and then shove that vegetation into or the plant material into their cheek pouches. And then once they're done clipping stuff off, then they can go back to a different portion of their burrow to eat it. So they're a really cool species. They're herbivores, which makes them very different in terms of their diet 
from the insectivorous moles. Pocket gopher mounds look like the mound in this picture. So we can see that instead of pushing the soil up from below and having a relatively round base like the molehill did, this pocket gopher came to the surface, either pushed or kicked the soil away from the opening and then plugged that hole. We can see the area that's been plugged because it has dried, this soil has dried at a different rate because it's got air coming from underneath of it. So this is where we would want to dig to find the opening. But pocket gopher mounds are going to be more oblong. Molehills are going to be, have round bases and uh, be at least rounded or even pointed, whereas the oblong uh, pocket gopher mounds are, are sort of flat on top. So as I mentioned, they're herbivores and they feed on plants in basically three different ways. One of those is to feed on roots while they're digging, as I mentioned. Another is to feed above ground near their burrow openings. And sometimes they're going to be feeding on green shoots and leaves when they're doing this. Other times they're going to be feeding on rhizomes or those lateral roots that go from plant to plant sometimes. They also will pull vegetation into a tunnel from below. When they do this, they're typically selecting forbs and they really like alfalfa and dandelions, but really any broadleaf herbaceous plant may be on the menu for, for, uh, for pocket gophers. So as opposed to moles, habitat modification can be effective for reducing damage caused by pocket gophers. So when we think about how to use habitat modification, we're trying to remove the food that is attracting the pocket gopher to the area. I mentioned that they like dandelions. So this yard looks like a really good yard for a pocket gopher to be in. This side of this yard looks like a really good place for a pocket gopher to be in. But this turf that's mostly probably Kentucky 31 fescue is not a good area for pocket gophers to be. So if we can control weeds, then that's a way we can reduce pocket gopher damage. If we're thinking about effective control for pocket gophers, one option is hand baiting using toxicants. So if we've got low to moderate numbers of pocket gophers in a yard, then this is going to be an option. Trapping is also going to be an option or as a follow up to hand baiting. So this is as opposed to when I say low to moderate numbers, really, if we're talking about a yard, these are going to be our two options. Um, the other option is to use something called a burrow builder to apply uh, toxicants, but that, that's an option that might be used in large hay meadows and that sort of thing, um, and it's going to be pulled behind a large tractor and apply the toxicant on a very large scale. Fumigation isn't effective for this species because they've got a complicated burrow system, and it's thought that they may be able to plug those burrows uh, more quickly than the, than the fumigant actually moves through the tunnel system. One test that Charlie did with this Rosal pocket gopher bait showed that he could get achieve a 90%, almost a 90% efficacy with one baiting at uh, this rate, about eight pounds per acre. Um, and this is through hand baiting. So when we do this, we're using either a homemade probe that's made out of pipe. Um, and first we're using a solid, probably steel rod probe to actually find the main runs in this burrow system. So a pocket gopher system is gonna have main runs and then there's gonna be branches off of that where we find the mounds that they've been cleaning out. So we're using a probe to push down through the soil profile. And when we lose resistance and that probe goes down really quickly, then we've found that, that burrow system and that's where we're gonna apply the bait. Trapping is done basically the same way, except instead of using a toxicant, now we're using traps. You can catch pocket gophers in their lateral runs where they're cleaning out the tunnel uh, by setting traps there, but the most effective way is to find that main tunnel. And the thing to remember with pocket gopher trapping is our traps are directional. So we're going to use two traps when we're trapping in the main tunnel. One is designed to catch them from this way. The other is catching them from this way. When we set in deep runs for moles, we always want to fill back in with soil because they are likely to not use that burrow system anymore if they can feel that fresh air down in the burrow system. 
pocket gophers, on the other hand, will want to try and come and plug the hole. And so for pocket gopher trapping, uh, we typically are going to leave those holes open. All right. So I've told you and showed you how to identify pocket gopher versus mole sign by their mounds. Let's do a quick poll really quick or just use the chat, I imagine, uh, to see how many folks can correctly identify which mound was made by a mole. Well, I'm not seeing answers come in, so I'm guessing that something's not working correctly. Oh, it's in the Q&A, maybe. All right, it looks like most of the folks are getting this correct and saying the one on the right or B is made by the mole. And that is exactly correct. And the reason is that this mole hill is relatively round at the base and it comes up to a point. The mole is pushing the soil from below. That soil is falling off to the sides as it does that. The mole uh, just barely ever gets above ground. Whereas this pocket gopher mound that's still in the process of being made uh, is made by the pocket gopher that has made this lateral run and it's pushing soil out or even kicking that soil out of that run. So good job on identifying the mole versus pocket gopher damage. All right, prairie voles. This is a species that I've been getting a lot of calls about over the last couple of years. Um, and they it's it's interesting how the biology of this species relates to the frequency of damage so pocket gophers are cyclic um, they actually have a fairly regular amplitude to their abundance so they'll get to a peak abundance and their numbers will be very very high up here and then that'll last for a year or two and then all of a sudden it'll crash and they become at very very low abundance uh, sometimes almost non-detectable in their native habitat. So like prairie or, uh, yeah, prairie, uh, that's their native habitat, but they can also be found in uh, introduced grasses like brome and that sort of thing. Um, so sometimes they're really, really abundant and sometimes there's almost none of them on the landscape and that's due to that cycle. The last couple of years, we've been around a peak at that cycle. And so uh, they, they've been in yards, especially in yards that are near areas with tall grass and a lot of cover. Um, and I get evidence sent to me that can be either the entrances to their colonies. So this is a, a colonial species. And we'll see that an entrance might have one or more holes. Uh, they're going to be somewhere between quarter and golf ball size in diameter. Uh, there can be a fair bit of soil disturbance around them sometimes where they've been cleaning out that, that colony or that below ground burrow system. Um, and they make really well-defined trails, uh, as you can see, sort of exaggerated in this picture on the right. Um, these trails are always present. They're just not always this obvious. So what's happened here is we've had snow cover on the ground uh, for an extended period of time. And those voles, because of that snow cover, basically only were cutting hay and foraging right next to their trail. And so they did a considerable amount of damage to that turf right next to the trails that uh, makes us go, holy cow, what's going on after the snow melts? And so this can be, this can be a very disconcerting thing to see out in the yard. Habitat modification is an option for voles. The, this species selects areas with really dense cover. So if I was looking for them uh, out in rangeland or you know not in town, I would go to areas of tall grass prairie that hadn't been burned recently. So they've got a lot of tall grass. They probably have a lot of thatch below that grass. Um, I might also go to um, a a brome field that hadn't been hayed or a ditch with lots of brome in it or something like that. 
So they're going to be in areas with dense grass or hay. So if we're wanting to use habitat modification to keep this species out of a yard or out of an orchard or out of a garden, those sorts of things, then mowing grass short is a really good way to keep that species um, from being active in that area. Also, don't allow hay to accumulate around important plants. I know of a situation where there was a, a fruit grower who was blowing all the hay when they mowed basically out of the center of the lanes and up against the trees in their orchard. And bowls got to high densities and they were using that hay as cover and they girdled almost all the trees in that orchard and killed them. Um, so don't allow that hay, which is their cover, to accumulate around important plants. If we're thinking about lethal control, trapping can be effective. Uh, if we're talking about controlling bulls in a yard, uh, we can use regular old snap trap style mouse traps. Um, but we're going to want to put some some maybe gutter material over the top of them or some split three or four inch PVC over the top of them to protect those traps from uh, capturing our cats or other species that might be incidental captures that, that we don't want to carry those traps away. If we're using toxicants, there are some really good, uh, very efficacious toxicants out there that are um, restricted use pesticides because we have to be really careful about how they're applied. Um, there are also some very effective non-restricted use pesticides that can be purchased at Orslands and, and Tractor Supply and, and Lowe's and those sorts of places. Um, and these are just going to be regular old rodent bait blocks. And there are some good YouTube videos about how to build an a, uh, applicator for those out of PVC pipe. So that is the main way that I've been recommending homeowners who are dealing with bowl damage try to um, build their own uh, bait stations for voles. And they've, they've done really well at that, uh, using that method. And if folks have questions about that, that's something they can always email me and I can send you some more information. You can also Google it yourself and find those YouTube videos as well. Rabbits and hares. So are rabbits and hares the same thing? That's something that, that a lot of folks are, are, might be unsure of if they don't come from a biology background. Um, they're in the same family, they're in the same order, but a rabbit is not a hare. So a cottontail, which is a very common species that we see throughout the state, is a rabbit. A jackrabbit is actually a hare with the longer legs and the longer ears and adaptations more for that desert environment that they are, are really adapted to. So when we're thinking about identifying damage that, that's caused by either rabbits or hares, we're looking for a couple of different things. On herbaceous plant material, we're gonna see angled cuts. So in this picture, you can see that Basically, the rabbit has maybe had its head turned sideways and it's used those long incisors to nip that vegetation off and it's going to be cut at an angle. Um, and that angle may also be created if they're approaching that head long and the way they're biting and their teeth are overlapping, that's causing that angled cut as well. When they're damaging woody plants, they're typically going to bite with their incisors behind the bark and then tear that bark off before they chew it up and eat it. So we're gonna see bark pulled off in strips. And all of this is gonna be very close to the ground with the exception of when we have lots of snow cover. And this is really the time when we most commonly see uh, damage to woody plants caused by rabbits and hares. Um, and when this occurs, that basically the height of the snow is gonna determine how high that damage is up on those plants. Rabbits and hares both can be very effectively excluded. If we're trying to protect, you know, woody ornamentals that we planted, just a, a chicken wire cage or another type of tree guard can work very well. We can reinforce uh, privacy fences or even uh, chain link fences in a yard situation with hardware cloth or chicken wire, or those sorts of uh, 
sturdy materials that that a, a rabbit especially a cottontail rabbit in this situation is going to have a hard time getting through there's other types of frightening devices that can work very well. These might fall under the repellent category. Um, this is my, my lab that I used to have named Bella. Did not have any rabbits in the yard when she was around because she enjoyed chasing them and the rabbits didn't like to be chased. They knew they were at risk in my yard and so they stayed out of it. There are also motion activated sprinklers that work much the same way that a yard light would work that's motion activated. So it's got that same style of sensor, but instead of turning on a light, it is spraying water, which most wildlife species do not like to have happen to them. Um, so that can be very effective if we're trying to protect specific areas in a yard or a garden. Rabbit repellents can also work. So at the Con Connecticut Ag Research Station, there was a study um, they had 131 rabbits per acre, so very high densities. Uh, these scores really don't mean anything to me, but they're, they're ranking themselves relative to a fenced control. So what we can see here is that this plant skid repellent that's shown over here on the right scored over 5,000, so relatively close to that fence control. And then we had others that scored in the hundreds. So that's pretty close to zero relative to 5,000. Uh, so the point here is that some of them can work. Some of them don't work very well. Um, and plant skid is one that has worked. If you would, try and remember that name, plant skid, because it's going to come up again in a little bit. We can also trap and remove rabbits. Uh, when, we're, when we're trapping rabbits to remove them, it's best to use a trap with some solid sides. Rabbits are very accustomed to going in tight spaces um, that are dark uh, and those sorts of things. And so they will readily enter a live trap with solid sides. Uh, this could be a plastic sided trap too, like some of the skunk traps that are on the market. They will enter cage traps, but I would recommend that the cage traps are not a very humane option to use on cottontail rabbits unless they're covered with cardboard or something because they sometimes in those cages will repeatedly hit their, their head against the side as they're trying to, to get out. Um, and that can cause some really gruesome injuries. And we don't want that to happen. We wanna be as humane as possible when we're removing, even if we're using lethal methods later on. All right, so here we have a white-tailed deer buck. And on the left-hand side of the picture, that buck has uh, received the hormone signals that, that indicated that it was time for its antlers to quit growing. Um, the velvet that has been protecting those antlers throughout the, the season of the year, the summer and spring when those antlers were growing, needs to come off. And so he's rubbing those antlers on some woody vegetation. When that happens out in the woods or in a rangeland setting and it's, it's a, a wild tree that nobody cares about or a sumac plant, as we can see here, then that's just a deer doing what a deer does. And we don't care. If you're a hunter, this is a sign that a buck's in the area. And so that's something you're excited to see probably. On the right-hand side, this is a smoke tree that my dad gave my mother for an anniversary present and then planted in the yard. And this damage from a deer rubbing its antlers on it was enough to kill that tree. So this is damage that we definitely want to try and avoid, whereas a deer rubbing on a, on a sumac plant is just a deer being a deer. It's just a deer being a deer in both situations, though. But it's our responsibility to protect those resources that we don't want them to damage. Deer damage to other plants, herbaceous plants can look uh, very different than the damage that they cause to woody plants, but it can also look similar. Uh, deer are highly adapted to eat parts of plants rather than whole plants like bulk foragers. So a, a cow, uh, cattle would be bulk foragers. They, they grab bites and they chew it all up um, and they, they eat whatever ends up in their bite most of the time, right? Well, a deer has a very selective diet, a very agile tongue, and a very narrow snout. And so they're going to select the specific parts of a plant that they want. They're going to eat the leaves off of woody plants as well as the tips of that new growth. Uh, 
Um, they sometimes will bite off corn plants at the whorl on a growing corn ear. They will bite the silks out uh, and interrupt that, that fertilization and growing process of, of that ear. And when we're looking for uh, signs of deer damage, one of the things that we're looking for that we can see somewhat in this picture is these rough cuts uh, where the deer has actually basically torn the vegetation off of that plant. They don't have upper incisors. So they're smashing that plant against the roof of their mouth, either with their tongue or their lower incisors and tearing it off. So we're gonna see rough cuts most of the time, unless they're biting something that's very tender, like the tip of a growing ear of corn. Here's a young Dr. Barden showcasing some of the research that he made his name on when he first came to K-State. And we're seeing how effective tree guards can be at protect, protecting plants. So this oak tree here was planted at the same time and exposed to deer for the same amount of time as this oak tree here that was protected by a tree guard. So tree guards can be very effective ways to exclude deer from damaging woody plants that we want to protect. We can also use fencing. Um, and the point of this is to show that fencing can be exorbitantly expensive or it can be relatively cheap and uh, the percent efficacy that we're looking for or the effectiveness of that fence that we're looking for is going to be one determining factor in how much we might spend. Um, the longevity that we're looking for is another thing that we're, all, that we're, that we're going to consider uh, when deciding what type of fence we're going to use. And then the other thing that we're going to think about is the value of our resource. So if we're thinking about chain link fence with barbed wire over the top of it that's that's like eight feet tall, then if we're trying to keep deer off a runway that a plane might hit, then that is a valuable enough situation where we're gonna be willing to spend more than $20 per meter on the fence. If we're trying to protect a garden, then we might be looking for an option where maybe we're only gonna be spending about $2 per meter or something like that. So you can spend as much as you want or as little as you want. This poly mesh fencing can be very good as long as it's tall enough. Remember, deer can easily jump over a six foot fence. Um, so if you're trying to exclude deer, we're gonna be thinking about an eight foot fence or taller if we're looking at a single layer fence. The nice thing about this poly mesh is it will also exclude raccoons and coyotes, opossums, and other critters that might come in. This is an example of a 3D electrified fence that is basically a optical illusion that deer do not think that they can cross. Deer have poor depth perception relative to ours. And so if they get shocked by this outer wire, they look at the distance between the inner and outer sets of wires, and they don't think that they can overcome that by jumping it. So it can be very effective to keep deer out of a garden um, or even food plots if we're trying to give food plots a chance to get ahead of deer. This is an example of a more permanent 3D fence that can be installed, um, 42 cents a foot. So relatively inexpensive uh, compared to some of the other options. And here we're showing that it's a baited electrified fence. So not only are we using the deer's poor depth perception to our advantage um, with the 3D design, we're also teaching them that the fence is bad by putting apple scent or peanut butter or something like that on aluminum foil that we've wrapped around that electrified fence. And so now we've got highly conductive aluminum, something that's food to a deer and a nice wet tongue touching that. And so we get a really good shock really quick and that teaches the deer that they wanna stay away from this fence. Here we have an orchard, so we're getting a little bit more valuable. And so now we're looking at options like maybe high tensile electrified fence that's gonna be more permanent, more durable, and less permeable than some of the other options. Deer repellents can work too. Uh, the point of this is we're looking at number of bites on the x-axis, and weeks in time on the Y, excuse me, number of bites on the Y axis and weeks in time on the X axis. And our red 
line is our untreated control. And these are woody plants in tree guards. And down in our, uh, excuse me, these are, these are woody plants. We've got an untreated control. We've got a bunch of different repellents in these different colors. And then this blue line here is a tree guard. So the point of this is some of the repellents work about the same as an untreated control, as no treatment. And some of them work about as well as a tree guard. And so if we're trying to protect plants from deer damage, that can be a very effective way. And if you'll look, this plant skid that worked really well for rabbits also is one of the repellents that can work very well for deer. These effects can be short-lived though, and we might have to reapply after a rain and those sorts of things. So this might not be a long-term solution, but if you're in a situation where you're willing to reapply, it might work well. All right, so now we have corn plants where the ears have been pulled down. The ear is still on the plant, but it looks like maybe even a person has eaten that corn off. Another broader picture, we can see lots and lots of corn plants have been knocked down. The same critter caused this damage. So we had a very high abundance of periodic cicadas uh, that were emerging in this picture and the raccoons basically plowed it up. Well, I just gave it away. This is raccoon damage. Um, the raccoons basically plowed this area of the yard up to get at those cicadas. You can see the same thing when we have high densities of white grubs. Raccoons are also really good at getting into uh, structures and those sorts of things because they're very intelligent. They have very dexterous front feet like our hands. They're also very strong. And so if there is a way to access something that they want to get to, they're pretty good at doing that. So if we're thinking about um, exclusion for raccoons, uh, we can see some very good options for fencing. I mentioned that, that poly mesh type electric fencing can work very well. Chicken wire may work too. Uh, removing food sources. A lot of people attract raccoons to their yards by feeding pets free choice on the porch. Um, and then raccoons and opossums and skunks end up in the yard and cause problems. So we that's removing those options. Um, and another option that is a food source attracting these critters to the yard that a lot of people don't think about is bird feeders and squirrel feeders. So removing that food is a good way to get keep this, this species from coming into the yard. Also, fix your garbage containers so that they can't be knocked over and that they've got a good tight lid on them. And trapping and euthanasia is the best option for removing raccoons. Please don't move them around on the landscape. They can carry canine distemper they can carry rabies. Um, by handling them in the traps that they've been in, you're potentially exposing yourself to raccoon roundworm, which is something that I promise you don't want. So trapping and euthanasia is the best option for raccoons. Luckily, they're, they easily accept cage traps and can be easily trapped that way. What about skunks? There's different species of skunks in Kansas. This one is the striped skunk and it's named for the stripe on its forehead. All the coloration back this way can be highly variable, but if you look at its forehead, you know that it's a striped skunk because it's got that stripe. On the other hand, this is a spotted skunk. This species is very, very rare in Kansas. It's a state threatened species. It's got a spot on its forehead. If you have damage being caused by striped skunks, you can trap and euthanize that species. If you have damage being caused by spotted skunks, you need to call the local authorities and get some help to deal with that. All right, so they're easy to recognize. Skunks want to be spotted, which I have this wrong here. That should say striped skunk. I apologize for that. Um, so thinking about habitat modification, we need to remove food sources, just like we talked about for raccoons. Exclude them. If they're getting under your house and spraying under your house every year, figure out how they're getting in there. Don't have open crawl spaces. Don't have uh, open foundations underneath sheds. So sheds that are up on skids are great places for them to be. Um, exclude them from those sorts of areas. 
trap and euthanize skunks. Please do not trap and move skunks around on the landscape. This is the number one carrier of rabies in Kansas. So we sure don't want to be moving rabies around on the landscape. We can create an odor neutralizing solution out of hydro hydrogen peroxide, baking soda, and liquid soap. Uh, this is very easy to create. And that recipe is in the Striped Skunk uh, publication on the KSRE Wildlife website. For trapping, they'll sure go into a regular cage trap, but a trap with solid sides like this Durapoly trap makes it much less likely that we're gonna get sprayed if we have to move them around. If they're in an open cage like this, we can move them around by draping a towel or a tarp or a blanket or something like that over the trap. Armadillos. Hey, so, Drew. Yep. I hate to cut you off, but we do want to have a little bit of time for questions. We've got, got about five minutes left. I think I've got two slides left. Okay. Go through pretty fast, please. Okay. So armadillos cause a lot of problems because they like to dig in yards and dig up grubs and earthworms, which are their main food. Um, so they've been new, moving north. They are omnivorous. They can be trapped in cages, but it's not very effective. Most folks who have effectiveness in trapping them with cages catch them with rotten bananas as fruit. So the better option if we're trying to catch them in cages is to use drift fence, like you can see Charlie setting up here. Here's just another extreme example of armadillo damage to show how bad it can be. And if you do want to live trap them, uh, these wooden armadillo traps from the armadillotrap.com that have armadillo scent in them uh, are the most effective. And when we're dealing with wildlife conflicts, these are all the different ways that we can do that. Remember, habitat modification, exclusion, removal, and if you got any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. This is Lynn with lots and lots of questions. So all of you that have questions, please get that email written down and send your questions to him directly. So let's go through these quickly. Why don't translocated animals survive? Well, we're moving them to good habitat, which means it's probably already occupied and it's occupied by individuals that are gonna defend their territory. So they might get killed by conspecifics or, or individuals of the same species that are already living there. They don't know where the food and shelter is when we put them there. So that's another reason that they often die. We're taking them from a place where they know where everything's at, like you do in your house, and throwing them into a new spot where they don't know where everything's at, including predators and those sorts of things. Um, they also try to get home most of the time. And when we move them far enough that they can't get back and they try to move home, um, they, they oftentimes end up emaciated, malnourished, uh, run over, uh, exposed to predators and those sorts of things. So survival is typically very low of translocated individuals. The opposite of that example is like grizzly bears, okay? Grizzly bears are a species that we highly value. Um, each individual is very valuable because they're slow to reproduce. And so we put a lot of money into moving ones that cause damage because they're endangered or threatened. And so when we move those animals, we do what's called a soft release. So we trap them where they're causing problems, take them somewhere else where we're pretty sure there's not under other individuals that they're gonna get in fights with. We keep them in a confined area and feed them and water them in that spot where we want them to stay and gradually introduce them to the environment over time. And that's how we can increase survival. That's not practical for most species of critters that cause damage. Um, and it doesn't always work with, the, with species like grizzly bears and black bears and mountain lions and lions and those sorts of critters either. Okay, the next question is, coyotes in our area are getting very aggressive. Is there something we can do about that? Yep, remind them, remind them that you're not something that they should be okay with. Yell at them, throw stuff at them, sticks, that sort of thing. Clap your hands real loud, make noise. Um, do whatever you can to let them know that, that you're scary 
and that they ought to be scared of you again because they've just basically gotten used to people because they're around so many people. Um, as you can see in this picture, coyotes can sure get over chain link fences. So don't consider that as a barrier between your pets and the coyotes. Keep your pets leashed if you're in an area where coyotes are known to be so that you can protect them from the coyotes. Can you talk anything about shrews and what's the difference between shrews and moles and mice and all those things? Well, sh shrews are insectivores like moles, um, but they're, they're gonna look more like a mouse. Uh, if, you, if you come across a little mouse looking critter that you can't see the eyes of, you can't see the ears of, it's grayish brown and it's somewhere between three inches long and an inch long, then it's probably a shrew. They, like voles or insectivores, are, and are gonna eat mostly animal material. Um, mice and voles, on the other hand, are rodents. They're gonna eat mostly plant material. They're gonna be bigger, different colored, mostly brown and shades of brown and that sort of thing. One more question before our time is up. There was several questions about toxicants, uh, the harm to pets, and then if it does kill, a wildlife pest and an owl or something would eat that body, would they also be affected? It, it, it depends 100% on the type of toxicant that it is. Most of the ones that are not restricted have low levels of secondary toxicity. Um, and so secondary toxicity would be if a cat ate a mouse, is it gonna kill the cat? Um, so that is something that, that really is gonna vary depending on the individual pesticide and you need to become accustomed to the labels, read the, read the labels and, and learn that information if that's something that you're concerned about. All right, everyone. We typically have more questions than we unfortunately have time for. Uh, but we will be sure and link several resources in uh, on our website tomorrow in the afternoon. Um, and do be sure and write down uh, Drew's email address. I know he would be willing to answer some of those questions. Thank you again uh, for joining the K-State Garden Hour series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. We are so glad you came, could be here today to learn about um, managing wildlife in your landscape and your home gardening. Uh, we have several interesting sessions coming up in our series, um, December, and then we'll be starting another series again in the spring. So be sure and visit the K-State Garden Hour website to see all of our upcoming topics. Uh, again, this session is recorded and posted on the website tomorrow afternoon. After the webinar ends today, you will also receive a prompt to take an evaluation survey. Please fill this out as we greatly appreciate any and all of your feedback. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at our email at gardenhour at ksu.edu. Um, we hope you continue to tune in the first Wednesday of each month. Have a great week, everyone.